Today we are going to talk about if bonking makes you faster. Let's get into it. Just right into it. Chad, we have a question from Jeff. He says, if I train till I bonk, does that mean my body will start using fat stores and I get leaner? Your answer. Uh, first, do you want to rephrase the question? You're, you're asking, does bonking <laughs> make you faster? Uh, and absolutely. It's the least known, most productive, quickest path to getting obscenely fast. <laughs> Amazing. And, Who knew? And, and, Why and none, of that's, faster? none of that's true. Okay. None of that's true. But we do know someone's some going to cut things. that out. <laughs> For sure. put on that's, why, that's why I left a long pause afterwards. So they could. Okay. So, so let, let's talk about what is actually true. And we have covered this before. We did a podcast, podcast way back. I think it was 200. And mm -hmm. a subsequent blog post that Sean did. It's quite good. Covers all the, these bases, but I'm going to restate them none the, nonetheless. First off, and then maybe this wasn't in there, so there will be some addition to it. And then we'll get to the, the real stuff. Uh, bonking can be a slow decline. And it, you know, it can come on real quick. You can put yourself in a spot where you do a whole lot of work with not a lot of sugar on board, or you just burn through it. And it can happen quickly. But as it's described here by Jeff, I think he's talking about running himself into the ground and then asking if you know the slow twitch fibers will take over and he'll metabolize fat more and get leaner, et cetera. So, but so, so in that case, with this slow decline, this does include your training stimulus and thus your training adaptation. So if you're just kind of going lower, 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 the stimulus that the muscle fibers, that the energy systems and all of those things that are linked to it are, are ex experiencing is probably not what you're after, not in terms of the adaptation that you're trying to derive. Secondly, the recovery of your glycogen, glycogen stores can take a heck of a lot longer than it would take otherwise. So, and I'm talking mm -hmm. a lot longer. So beyond 48 hours, up to 72, 84, it can take a long time to get you back to where you were if you neglect it to the point where you do run yourself into the ground. Chad, can I ask? I mean, that's <clears throat> that's why when we see athletes at Grand Tours that do end up bonking and running themselves low on fuel, that it's quite rare actually to just like the next day that they'll bounce back. Super um, hard to come back quickly. Yep. Especially, and we'll actually touch on that. The subsequent days have a, have a, an increasing impact. And the same, uh, same effect, like a lot of people, they, it's a common pattern, right? Where like people will train with structure during the week. And then on Saturdays or Sundays, they'll go and they'll do their big rides and they'll just bonk themselves into oblivion on those big rides. And then I've seen Chad there's do it. Some, and like, <laughs> yes, he was there, yeah. front, front, front row seat. <laughs> and even though you're not in the middle of a grand tour, that means that your subsequent workouts during the week will be compromised, like your ability to perform how you typically would. So it's well, the reason that I'm pointing out this notable example that we've all seen is because it actually does apply to us. Sure, we're not as fast, different races, but it does apply to us even on that week to week when we're just going through training. Like if you put your, if you start your training disadvantaged, you can't expect typical results from it. So I've, I've big... bonked in trainer road indoor workouts are like two hours where I haven't ate. I didn't eat enough. I was like, well, I'll just do it. And then 90 minutes in you like struggle so hard for those last 30 minutes. Uh, sure. I don't get run. <laughs> of course, not as run down as what Chad's talking about, but still it's impact for many days. Mm -hmm. For sure. Just Sorry, Chad. I just glycogen. wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So, so bonking or running yourself into the ground can also open us up to other unfavor unfavorable aspects of you know, putting ourselves in this state, one of which is muscle loss. So the actual muscle protein degradation, the thing we all try to avoid when we're concerned with running low on sugar, and we think we just cut over to metabolizing muscle tissue. But either way, it, it does open up that door, uh, it lowers our immune response. It's never a favorable thing. Now we're more open to becoming ill and potentially physically dangerous. I mean, if you actually bonk to the point of low blood sugar, and that's basically what we're talking about, that we are going to differentiate a little bit later, it can be dangerous. I mean, heading down a hill, riding in traffic, you know, all the things. I mean, just staying balanced on your bike. Hmm. Um, and then I think it's easy to lose sight of the fact that when you deplete muscle glycogen, you are also dehydrating the muscle to a great extent. I mean, glycogen is packed with a lot of water. It takes a lot of water out of the muscle. And I do think uh, personally, but you know, there is some research that kind of ties that this does tie to cramping um should be stated that this is not the same as fasted training so it, it, this this form bonking intentionally mind you it lacks intention it lacks structure it, and it lacks the pro the planned nutrition that most people who do fasted training have lined up post-workout or even prior to the workout but in any case it's not the same thing and this is another thing that i think is quite important and gets overlooked 
far too often is that you're now associating training with negative feelings and that can absolutely impact your motivation. So now you know how bad this feels and, and just however weak the link is, however deep down in your subconscious it is, it still exists. It's still there. Now something that's already hard to do has some something else kind of pulling it down, pulling on it anyway. That's a okay. really good point. Uh, sorry, sorry, Chad. That's just a really good point that's probably overlooked. The psychological attachment i mean we're talking about like basic like conditioning that happens classic yeah. conditioning right of you do this you feel this or this happens and if you keep reinforcing that it does make it a lot harder to get back on the bike i can't think of the last time that i bonked and then i was i was like man i just can't wait to get up back on my bike like <laughs> like it's oh, yeah. it's like the best I'm way to make riding. yourself not want to train <laughs> yep. you know yeah it's really really that's a salient point good job Okay, so so quickly, let's just define what bonking is, and I mean very quickly. It's just glycogen depletion coupled with the ensuing manifestations of fatigue, okay? But, and something we don't talk about enough, I think, is that bonking can happen in a couple ways. Um, first of which, there's liver depletion. And it strikes me as odd that we have not talked about this at any great length over the course of near, nearly 400 podcasts now. But mm -hmm. should you deplete the glycogen in your liver, you're dealing with hypo hypoglycemia, right? Low blood sugar. And the liver regulates blood sugar. That's it's one of its many jobs. And it is the only endogenous source, the only internal source of glucose to that end for regulating blood glucose. So regardless of muscle content, if the liver's low or empty, then a lack of exogenous carbohydrate, carbohydrate that you eat could actually be a limiter. And what comes to mind with me is early morning workouts where for whatever reason you are running exceptionally low, maybe a prior night's workout or just didn't nourish well the day before. In any case, you wake up with a lower than typical glycogen content in your liver. You could run that down pretty quickly. Um, workouts following fasts and whether those fasts are intentional ones or not. I mean, we've all found ourselves at the end of a day, saddle on the bike, realizing, oh, I did not eat that much today. And you know, it's going to catch up with you better hit the gels or something. Uh, workouts on days where carbohydrate intake is light or very light. And this is different from what I just described because I'm now talking about those people who aren't necessarily fat adapted athletes, but they suddenly decide I'm going to go low carbohydrate during my training to, to reap some benefits that I don't quite understand. But the takeaway is that you could bonk even with full muscle stores. So kind of crazy and I should note, <laughs> and, and I should note, and, and it kind of ties with that is you, you can't pull glycogen or, or glucose from the muscles. That, that's not a thing that happens. There's a, there's an enzyme, there's a reaction that happens when glucose enters the, the muscle. It's phosphorylated to this glucose 6-phosphatase. The enzyme necessary to break that down, kick it back into the bloodstream, doesn't isn't present in the muscle. So it's in the muscle. It's locked in the muscle. It will be utilized by the muscle. Only way it makes it back into the bloodstream is if, you know, lactate is kicked into the bloodstream, goes through the liver, is reconverted to glucose. This whole thing, this whole drawn out, belabored process. Mm -hmm. So it's effectively in there. So now let's get on to the real question, which is what Jeff asked about, which is, will I get leaner? And in, uh, I love this because it's in true endurance athlete fashion. I'm going to run myself into the ground. This is going to be miserable. It's going to be awful. But will I learn how to metabolize fat a little bit better? Will I get a little bit leaner? And and uh, all of us can relate to that. It's yeah. it, it's always a concern. So what he's also asking or uh, determined a different way, will I get better at metabolizing fat? Will I achieve aerobic or oxidative adaptations? And that includes, you know, burning fat, sparing glycogen, all the things. Short answer, maybe. But muscle depletion is not necessary to stimulate this oxidative or these aerobic adaptations that he's seeking. You can underfuel. That's the training load we kind of just described. That signals anaerobic, or I'm sorry, aerobic adaptation. Endurance training in and of itself stimulates aerobic adaptation whether it be long, slow distance, high intensity interval training, sprint intensity training, et cetera, all of these things can stimulate aerobic adaptation as long as there's a level of consistency, adequate uh, sorry, recovery, and proper nutrition. And going this route is far less detrimental to further training in terms of the, the, the metabolic disruption, the unfavorable hormonal shifts, the muscle protein and synthesis and degradation processes, immune health, literal danger on the bike, et cetera. So my short answer to the short question is, sounds like a pretty unhealthy and unpleasant way to achieve something that can be done in a better, safer, more productive manner. Yeah. Nate, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of safe and productive manner, I didn't realize we were live. 
until you just said something. <laughs> and that is so, so dangerous that uh, so dangerous. Uh, oftentimes we'll just stop and say stuff. And then uh, Jonathan typed in the doc, like, kid. I don't see us on YouTube. And I was like, oh my gosh. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think every time we bonk, you think that you are gonna get this huge super compensation, right? And you think that that's like the saving grace is although I'm trashed, I'm gonna come back so much stronger. And I think I do come back stronger, but to John's point, at the time I lose, not training, like it takes so, so long and I don't get that big of a boost. So um, I, I hate it. It's some of the, I feel like when you bonk are the times you actually remember going hard years later. Like we talked about <laughs> Chad, like years later, remember it. I remember when uh, Chad's ride, Pete and I were doing like maybe 120 watts and dropping him. And then Leadville, I was doing, I thought I was doing 300 watts. I looked down, I was doing 80 watts. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I think um, that's, something, that, that's a yeah. good point. It, 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 you, you think that now I, I don't have any muscle sugar left, so I'm just going to rely on fat. So I do understand the logic of this question, but you have to recognize that even at very low levels of intensity, there's still carbohydrate being contributed yes. to the mix, still being utilized. That's a great point because someone's going to say, well, bonking, it's not really bonking because you do have some glycogen left. And I think they've they even like put uh, put electrodes to people or to like dead frogs, right? Or something and, sh and shown mm -hmm. that there's still something yeah. left. Yeah. But uh, I think in terms of uh, an endurance sport, bonking is when you, you it's like a, a whole nother level of uh, RPE and your performance just drops incredibly, incredibly low. And I think some people say they bonk when they really just, they don't feel it. But the people who have bonked, you know, and it's hard to describe like the exact specific, I have this much glycogen left. Uh, and it's not we, productive we training stress. I, I, I see again, you know, if, if the greater the stimulus, the greater the adaptation, this means if I, I mean, this is a pretty powerful stimulus. Well, it may seem like a powerful stimulus, but it's not actually a stimulus. It's just a, a series of systems that are collectively failing as one. Yeah. Like if I could share on this, <clears throat> um, Nate or Chad or anybody listening to this, you could go and make sure that your life is as stressful as possible. So then when you train, you're under I additional do. load, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So then you train, you're under additional load, Fair all that allostatic yeah. load coming in. It doesn't make you better in terms of training on your bike. And here's a principle that I want to communicate to Jeff and everybody else listening to this. The best athletes I know seek to do everything they can to lower their RPE. Whereas amateur athletes commonly seek to increase their RPE because mm -hmm. they think that that increased RPE is somehow equating to better gains or better adaptations. But the best athletes I know do the opposite of that. They're, they're really excited when they're like, I was doing this much and it felt easy today. And I'm going to do this because it's going to make my workout more capable, more possible. So do everything that you can to lower RPE don't fall into the trap of trying to just increase RPE so that you're getting more for your training. Cause you're actually not, you're just adding more strain and making it so that it's diff more difficult for your body to absorb that training. John, how mm -hmm. do you see, what is Keegan's lifestyle like off the bike? Like, can you describe before, after, <laughs> and just during the day uh, you're laughing, but I think people should yeah. hear this cause you know, Keegan's yeah. one of the best cyclists in America, if not the best sure. cyclist. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that we are just joking about it uh he had a video that he was that rafa is going to post about him today about his season and russell finsterwald joked around because keegan said something like you know it's endurance racing is just like a long game of chicken and i'm not going to give up and he said something like that mm. he said i wonder if you use that same tactic when sophia asks you to unload the dishwasher um <laughs> and <laughs> so i'm bringing that up is because he is very good at organizing his life to have minimal strain now this doesn't like uh, this doesn't mean that he doesn't have a single responsibility outside of riding his bike. He does have them, but he puts everything that he can into organizing those so that they are automated or they are taken care of and that there are no surprises. And then when there are surprises, he has systems in place to handle it. He gets up. He doesn't uh, force himself to get up early. He optimizes. He gets as much sleep as possible. That's, no uh, that's number one. Yep. That's gets up when he feels it. Yep. Now, and it's a luxury that's absolutely like one that athletes in this sort of realm should employ and all of us as well. Uh, it, we should look for spots where we can increase the amount of time we're sleeping. That's what we can get from that. We may have to have an alarm clock, but we have to do that. I had that two years when we had like no employees and it didn't matter when I started and I would like go to sleep at three, sometimes 10. That was, it's bad to have your sleep schedule change, but it was amazing. You felt so much better when you just woke up when you woke up. Uh, yep. I wish. Yeah. Yeah, everything should start later. 
Anyway, especially podcasts. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Sorry, Nate. <laughs> and then the other thing that he does is as he goes throughout the day, like he puts a huge amount of focus into his meals and he puts a huge amount of focus into his training. And everything is designed around enabling that. Now, granted, I know you're talking about, yeah, he's a pro athlete, but that doesn't mean that we can't apply those same principles. Um, think of all the things that you're piling into your life. Chances are we're piling in unnecessary stuff. Like, are we just doom scrolling on Twitter? Uh, are we going through and just surrounding ourselves with a bunch of negativity? Twitter, uh, how old are you? TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter's gone now. <laughs> doom scrolling, I feel like, is most appropriately matched with something like Twitter. So um, are you just surrounding yourself with, you know, bad negative things? If so, maybe you can alleviate those because think about it. Are they actually serving you? And he does a really good job of that. He doesn't focus on like the bad stuff. Instead, he changes that around. Uh, once his training's done, he does have, like he forces himself, like he cleans the bike and then that's it. Or he gets his stuff ready for the next day and that's it. And then after that, it's full on recovery, spends a half hour stretching and doing mobility work every night and times out every single one of those things to make sure that he's doing that. But it's it, his life is entirely enabling the training that's the focus of the life and mm -hmm. and it's monk like and it's repetitive and it's not interesting and that's the thing that uh, i was watching a video with gustav eden recent recently uh it was looking at uh, he was up in spain up in sierra nevada up at a uh up at like a training facility high elevation training facility and it was an absolutely boring vlog he was just talking about his life and he and it was intended to be boring he was just showing what he actually does his life is not exciting but his life is really productive for training. So for all of us, we have a lot of other things going on in our lives that keep our life exciting, but it should still serve as an example for us to think about how can we remove barriers and enable ourselves to train more. And this falls directly in line with bonking. If you look at what those athletes do, the last thing they're trying to do is run themselves out of fuel. They're trying to give themselves more fuel all the time. Keegan's eating bowls of cereal, like four of them a day, um, in addition to all the other meals that he has. Uh, he's doing everything that he can. The same thing with Gustav Eden, you'll see. So for those, they enable what, John, what John just said too, you can fall into a trap for people who have full-time jobs and a partner. You know, this is Keegan's job, right? So that's how he makes money. And um, some people can, I think, take advantage of their partners in the situation because they really want to do a sub nine at Leadville. And there's a difference between having a, a specific communication where your partner supports you through something and just kind of ignoring like, you know, equal, equal load in the house and that sort of thing, or saying I'm too tired to do it because you want to do this and not being clear communicated, but being, uh, what implicitly communicated that the, it should be this kind of way. And I, I think us guys probably do that more often than women. And, uh, mm -hmm. that's just something to be aware of that can be a lot of stress. And then, you know what that does too? for those people who are really concerned about being fast that adds extra stress and then you'll get slower like yep. it's a temporary good thing but a long-term bad thing so i'm just i would pay attention to that and have conversations with your partner uh, about that i just had it's, a it's, yeah i just yeah. had a question sent to me about this on instagram yesterday because uh, they asked they said how in the world are you training with because i'm doing the low volume half distance triathlon plan right now and they're like how are you training while having two kids like and the question was, and then the question after that was, does your wife just take care of the kids so you can just work and train? And I said, no, not at all. Instead, what we have to do is I have to sit down and I say, before I did this training plan, when I was looking at plan builder, I said, Hey, Sarah, here's what I'm looking at in terms of training plan commitment. Here's how it would work and how it would stack out in our days. Is this something that's possible? And that's how we decided on low volume. <laughs> like low volume wasn't decided as like a, I want to do low volume. It was our life can sustain only low volume, anything more than that. And I can't sustain it right now. Yeah. So, especially with the tri plan, right? So Triathlon's we made that hardest, decision. Yeah. And then from there it was, okay, so how do we fit these things in? And that's why I'm training early mornings uh, again now. So I'm starting training at 5 a.m. And then that way I can get all my training done. And then I can help with everything with the family in the morning and still get that going. And it's like, you know, my training isn't coming at the cost of the family at that point. I just go to bed when our kids go to bed at eight o'clock. And then that way I can get up and then I can be ready to go uh, for that 5 a.m. workout. Then for in the evenings, which is typically when I used to train, we had to have the discussion of like, no more evening training. It's too hard. Like you're gone on your bike and you come back exhausted. And meanwhile, I'm having to take care of the kids when they're crazy, when, you know, Simon's crazy after school. And then I'm having to make dinner and do all that stuff. You like, I need you there. So I had to change that approach too. So that's why if I have two workouts in one day, I do my second workout at lunch. 
And then I'll, if I need to make up time with work, I make it up in the evenings. Once the kids are going to bed, I'll do it then make up that extra hour if I need to. So you have to communicate it beforehand or else you just end up running yourself into, into a hole. Maybe I'm, a. uh, we're drifting too far here, but Nate, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, it's probably really relevant for a lot of our, our audience. So, uh, Jefferson's question says, I have a unique difficulty with VO2 max workouts that has been consistent for five years across many different workouts from my coach, from other training plans. And in the past trainer road, unless I'm heavily fatigued, I generally have to add five to 10% to the power target just to feel like I'm doing an actual workout. Please listen to that part again. What he's saying is that he has to add intensity to VO2 workouts to make it feel like he's getting a productive workout. This is very different from what some athletes write in about, but this is a great reminder that just because you find one sort of workout hard doesn't mean that everybody does. Every person's different. This is why we built adaptive training is to account for these sort of situations. Um, but they then say, of course, eventually I go hard enough that I feel there that I can't finish an interval, but if, after turning it up five to 10%. But it feels like because I become anaerobic, not because I'm reaching aerobic limits, which we'll discuss that. Rarely do I feel like I'm much past VT2 or ventilatory threshold two. It's not because my FTP is set incorrectly. Whenever I think this, my next threshold or sweet spot workout absolutely removes that idea from me. Endurance and tempo feel just about right as well, based on RPE. So I'm 52 years old. I've been training about six to 12 hours per week for the past five years. I have a long history as a cross country ski racer and some as a runner, though neither of those recently. I have no history of structured training on a bike before the last five years. My coach and I are planning to test the theory that I cannot recruit enough muscle fiber on the bike to effectively stimulate that system of VO2 max. During the build phase, we are planning to do one VO2 max session uh, per week in the gym using exercises that involve all four limbs, like a rower, kettle bear, a kettle ball, kettlebells, air bike, et cetera or on skis if snow is available. We're also going to work on muscle endurance and fiber recruitment, but in the meantime, we're going to try stimulating that VO2 max system off the bike. Do you know of any research that has tested this kind of approach? Five stars all around. So this is, we're going to have to give kind of like our best guess in our theories, right? On this one, Chad, like mm -hmm. we don't have the, the, the cure all answer for this one, but this is an interesting question to rephrase it simply. When I do VO2 max workout, I feel like I don't get worked hard enough. So I have to really turn it up to be able to get what I feel like is reaching that peak aerobic uptake of VO2 max. So that's what Jefferson's communicating to us here. Chad, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't prepare anything for this because it was rife with so many things that I think we can just totally jive on. There's mm -hmm. uh, sentences that really stand out to me and I'm just gonna start picking one at random and we'll, we'll try to cover all of them. Cool. First off, he does he does admit. I'm assuming Jefferson is a he. Jefferson admits I generally have to add five to ten percent to the power target just to feel like I'm doing an actual workout. That's preceded with unless I am heavily fatigued. So he's telling us right there he's going into these workouts heavily fatigued, and that's the only way he experiences VO two max work, and then he can't touch high aerobic limits. Well, if you're heavily fatigued, I wouldn't expect you to be able to. So I think there's a there's a flaw in your in your line of thinking. First off, if you're going to work at high percentages of your VO2 max, you need to be reasonably fresh. Yeah, you probably can't recruit uh, the, the particular fibers you want, or if you can, they might be stripped of fuel. If you're heavily fatigued, well, they probably are. So you're not setting the stage appropriately for success in this type of work. That's simply how, how that works. Um, and then he goes from, you know, to the point where he just becomes increasingly anaerobic or just immediately anaerobic, which just tells me the same thing. He just has to push well past what his aerobic capacity can do, delve into anaerobic territory, bomb out pretty hard, and then you know wonder what's up. So at the moment, I, I would pin so much of this on fatigue. You guys want to talk on that before I move on to the next point? Um, yeah. Well, he says, I'm so confused. Go, go John. Yeah, this is, <clears throat> you feel this too, Chad, like uh, when, if you're trying to stretch the season long and you're not really following the plan mm -hmm. and you're just chasing comms, right? And Same you're just idea. going out and you're really just doing too much work. You shouldn't be doing that work and you're not sticking to a structured plan. Um, you feel that lack of productivity, like you're trying, like you're just hitting your head again, beating your head against the wall with VO2 work. Um, it doesn't sound like that's his situation that he's hitting. So like you said, very keen observation. That's probably not the case. 
Nate, go ahead. Yeah, so we were just talking, John. Uh, I, was just, I was trying to figure out if Jefferson is on Trainer Road, and it seems that he's not on Trainer Road at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no account was was passed through at least in, in that option. So, so what I just see here is the word of saying I generally have to add five to ten percent of the power target to feel like I'm actually doing a workout. I would think that your power targets are too low then, like just starting off. So whatever, if you're doing a percentage of threshold or however you're figuring out VO2 max power, I don't think it's done. Um, I would I would change that because why would you if you always have to add ten percent to feel like you're doing a workout just to feel like you're doing a workout for VO two max, like yeah. three by three by three or five five by three minutes at one hundred and twenty percent of FTP if that doesn't feel hard, I yeah I just think the power target's too low like this that's like I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. me. Give me five minute VO two intervals or three minute ones and tell me five to ten percent increase and I'm like oh my gosh like <laughs> you know that's we couldn't do it that would be so rough. This is, but Nate, isn't this why the, when we talk about creating adaptive training and everything else is to allow you to decouple, that's like one well, yeah, of the that, main things. Cause some people just have unique VO two abilities and others just simply don't. That's what I was going to look at because, and with adaptive training, if someone did that workout and like they didn't turn it up and they said it was easy or moderate, the next workout would be harder until we get to the, to the right, uh, mm -hmm. point. So Chad, Chad, like. I, I just don't understand how somebody going more, but I don't understand how someone could not feel a VO two max workout, but they have enough mm -hmm. anaerobic, they could go anaerobic. So they, they like, it's not a, a muscle limiter if they can actually turn up enough and go anaerobic. Exactly. I don't, so, so it's, yeah. it's not a neural issue. It's not a recruitment issue. It's probably a metabolic issue. There's simply not enough fuel on board. I think the, 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 the muscle is just too stripped of glycogen. I think there's too much fatigue. Uh, however, that's manifesting, that's mm. impacting everything. And he says when he jumps into threshold or sweet spot workout, he, he's immediately disabused of the idea that his threshold is set too low. Well, again, if you're carrying fatigue into workouts like those that are very demanding and longer intervals, that's what it's going to feel like. You're going to, it's just going to be a grind. You're never going to have a good day doing sweet spot or threshold if, again, you're overly fatigued, uh, insufficiently supplied of carbohydrate or muscle glycogen, whatever it may be. And this is <clears throat> some people like we'll send a like a message or in the live chat, they'll be like, gosh, you're talking about carbs again. And the reason that we're talking about it is because a lot of us, we're even though carbs we listen, all day today. Yeah, even though we listen to it all the time and we hear it all the time, we don't actually understand we don't apply it to ourselves, right? Like it hasn't sunk in quite yet. Uh, I, even though I'm somebody that fuels at around hundred to 120 grams of carbs an hour and does all those things, I still find myself in situations repeatedly where I'm under fueled. And like, it's, it's a part of my training that I need to stay up on. So assuming that that is the case, if Jefferson is, uh, you know, really, you know, food or carb deprived in this case, yeah, that, that would make absolute sense. It would nerf everything. The one thing that's interesting though, is this whole idea of compartmentalization with an energy system that like... <clears throat> like the VO2 is entirely different than threshold or sweet spot. And they pull on the same systems in different ways and unique ways. But to your point, Chad, this is another thing I want to point out to that, that or highlight that you said, <clears throat> just because one system feels unique or one sort of workout feels uniquely hard from another, you can't assume that you're going to go back to another one and just, it's going to be an entirely different story. You're pulling on the same strings. So uh, this makes sense if they're like, oh, I think my FTP is too low. And if they're depleted and they go back and do an uh, aerobic workout. Chad, can a low carb diet too make it more difficult to hit the power of VO2 max? I think that's what you're getting at too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's like, exactly what I'm getting at. So it could be fatigued, could be that low glycogen state, or it could be like a keto diet. And that is also makes it harder, especially to do uh, mm -hmm. sustained intervals. Mm -hmm. Jefferson's, 100%. Jefferson's, oh, sorry, Chad. Uh, Jefferson's other assumption here is that there's like a, a monster VO2 max aerobic engine because of running and then also because of Nordic skiing and having like a lot of recruitment that they use and thusly as a result, they've achieved really high VO2 max values with that. And perhaps they just can't achieve those same levels of recruitment with just spinning their legs on the bike. What are your thoughts on that, Chad? Yeah, that, that's for sure. VO2 is going to be higher when you're involving more muscle mass. So if you're doing something like polling in addition to moving your legs up a, up a hill, then, or even running for that matter, you're going to see higher, higher VO2, high, higher oxygen consumption. That's just, just how it works. I don't think that's going to tell him a heck of a lot with regard to what's going wrong with his cycling training. Um, and backing up just a little bit, he does mention he's 52 years old and he's training six, 12 hours a week. 
that's a first off it's a wide range uh, what the composition of that training is we don't know uh, that amount of training 12 hours a week at, at 52 years of age you got to get a lot of things right to make that productive the whole time uh, I assume there's more aspects to his life than his training especially you know six 12 hours a week tells you that but again I, I, all of this just traces back to fatigue for me and and maybe just him in, in, uh, insufficient nutrition which you know mm -hmm. supports or doesn't support or leads to that fatigue um yeah and then the the whole idea that he and his coach are planning to test the theory that he can't recruit enough muscle fiber i wish there were more detail on that because I, I i i don't know how you're going to do that uh it just mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how you're going to do that short of involving uh maybe getting a vo2 max test checking out your rar if you're going to go to a lab you're probably going to achieve some good things uh, if you're going to do something as extreme as a muscle biopsy I mean, do so with caution because i, I <laughs> oh came boy. across a study the i think it's a pretty recent study maybe last four or five years might even be more recent than that but it, this one stood out to me especially because and this for for let's just get this out of the out of the way now this is basically the glycogen episode all these questions in some way tie back to <laughs> muscle glycogen it really is and, and, and yeah. it's a it's an appropriate topic it's uh it's on everyone it's it's not a paradigm shift i think we're just coming to terms with how important carbohydrate is and questioning why the heck we got away from it in the first place um so should you go the biopsy route do recognize that a single puncture from a single muscle is only telling in certain manners it, biopsies can be useful very useful in certain ways and they can tell you a lot about a muscle but they are without their their problems this study in particular they did 10 muscle biopsies in the vastus lateralis. So they were looking at cyclists and endurance athletes. And the vastus lateralis is the, the outer quadricep. It's a big muscle mass. It's highly recruited during both cycling and running and cross-country skiing and a lot of endurance sports, even rowing to a, to a lesser degree. But they did, uh, so they started to 10 centimeters above the patella, above the kneecap took the first puncture and then they basically went up two centimeters times five oh. each time. So, so that's five punctures per leg. And what they were looking that's at terrible. is, you know, what is the fiber composition? And they were just looking at fiber composition, but I think they also looked at the glycogen, but you know, what changes as we move up the leg and what changes from leg to leg. And some of the findings were that the leg to leg, not a heck of a lot of difference, but as they moved up the leg, they got huge variances in, in the, the, the fiber type. And, and I think glycogen content too, but this was mostly geared toward, toward, toward fiber types. And what they recognized was that these variances, uh, I think it was like a 22% average variance per puncture site, as high as 44%. So wow. if you extract muscle tissue, you know, say close to the knee, and then you go up two, four, six, eight centimeters and do, do another extraction, and you have a 40% or even a 30% variance, you can draw very different conclusions from what you're seeing. And, and, you know, maybe tailor training or make assumptions based on information that isn't exactly right. So it's not fully homogeneous across. I mean, where you puncture, even within the same muscle on the same leg can be very different between sites. Cool. I, yeah. Uh, okay. Let's just move on. The VT2 <laughs> right here. Jefferson said that, uh, got a lot he, really do I'm I feel like I moved on from there. I thought he was going to get stuck onto it and try to rope us into more biopsies. <laughs> no, I was, Every time I bring but... a biopsy, I do it with caution. I know. Uh, so he says that he can't get much past VT2, which is that second ventilatory threshold. I actually said it right Ventil that time. Threshold. And that's when you yeah, yeah. ventilatory, I said it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Uh, and that's when you start to, you know, instead of regular breathing, you start to have that rhythmic breathing and then VT3, which is what you get to in VO2 max as when you're you know breathing very hard like that kind of thing and i'm it's very um that's the part that's worrying i think it's more due to the fatigue too what chad said that he says he rarely can get past vt2 because even in a threshold he says his fdp is set correctly try to do it for an hour you'll hit vt3 like chad you've talked about this all efforts lead to <laughs> vo2 max right eventually if you can't get there most likely fatigue uh, that's what i think fatigue um and or combination of diet uh yeah. what do you think I, I fully agree. I think all, all I'm just, signs. I'm just saying fatigue. your 
your hypothesis back at you. I'm like, Chad, what do you think? Like, Nate, you're well, exactly think right. It. I mean, if you're trying to hit your, your VO2 max using a 105% effort, it's going to take you quite some time to do that. So it's going to become more of a muscle endurance effort, which requires glycogen, requires carbohydrates. So you, you're simply not going to be able to elevate. You're not going to be able to get to the point you're, you're getting to. And that's, you know, maybe he's doing 110s, 120s, whatever, but if you can't, it's it's just a, a lack of fuel. I, I really think that's it. And maybe it's the fatigue that's coming into the workout, but that's probably tied to you know, how much glycogen he's actually packing around and where that glycogen is. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Before we do, though, I, I don't want to touch on another thing that he mentioned in here. Um, they're planning to do a VO2 max session per week in the gym using exercise involving all four limbs. And this, again, may elevate total body VO2. But it's not going to, this isn't the stress you're looking for. If you're looking to become a better cyclist, you have to improve the VO2 mechanisms or me mechanics in the muscles that are going to be driving the bike. So you, you got to focus on your legs. So yeah, maybe you get a better overall total body VO2, VO2 max with this total body exercise. And these are good workouts and they're beneficial in a more uh, central manner, your lungs, your heart, your, your uh, circulatory system, et cetera. Again, I think you're you're a little off target with what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to do with your time. Yeah. This is uh, Jefferson. This is why we created adaptive training. And the way that it will work in this way is that when you'd fill out your post-workout surveys and you'd say that VO2 max workout felt easy, it would recognize that and then say, okay, we're going to accelerate the rate at which they progress through VO2 max. So then it would get <clears> you <throat> closer to the point where you're working at higher intensities or longer at the same intensities and it would get you reaching that VO2 max like you need uh, at a quicker rate while still keeping everything else also manageable. All of us have different abilities in different zones and, and that's why we did it. So <clears throat> I think that that's, you know, of course my recommendation for it. So uh, if you are watching the podcast right now on YouTube, thank you. Give us a thumbs up. And if you're listening to this, we appreciate it. Rate the podcast five stars. It's the highest rated podcast on Spotify and on iTunes. Keep it in going. cycling. And cycling, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, Joe, Joe Rogan ain't got nothing on us. Um, and uh, yeah, but please share it with your friends. That's a huge help for us. And submit your questions at trainroad.com slash podcast. David's question says, you've discussed at great length the importance of carb intake for endurance athletes. We're just getting started, David. Uh, I'm on a train road plan, my current and currently to train for Mid-South. That's a gravel race for those that don't know. In March 2023 or 2023. I'm working out or working to train my gut to comfortably handle upwards of 90 grams of carbs per hour on the bike. I'm also following a strength training plan from a friend of trainer road dialed health. Nice way to go. My question is, should I be fueling with carbs during a strength workout, particularly if I do it in the morning before breakfast, is there an advantage to doing strength workouts fasted instead? Thanks for the great product and for the excellent advice you give on the podcast from David. It's a good one, Chad. Mm-hmm. What say you? Yeah. So I, I got a fair amount on this one. So do not hesitate to chime in, ask questions, interrupt me. Awesome. Uh, there are, I understand <laughs> the motivation behind this question because there are uh, really, uh, we're kind of in the midst of a shift right now w w regarding carbohydrate ne need or necessity when it comes to strength training. There are a handful of studies, not, not hard to find that Note that low muscle glycogen doesn't appear to impede muscle protein synthesis or the overall muscle anabolic response. So again, you know, why would we concern ourselves? A couple studies I came across didn't have to search too hard, whether it's uh, within strength training or resistance training, typically over the course of even a high volume strength training workout only deple depletes whole muscle glycogen 25 to 40%. So again, if we've still got ample glycogen on board, why would we concern ourselves? Uh, and, and often enough, we know this through experience, and there's plenty of research to, to back this up as well. We often train at lower than optimal levels of glycogen, yet we still have perfectly productive workouts. Many of us under fuel, we end up in a less than fully replete state, still perform well on race day. But past a point, low muscle glycogen can carry performance consequences. Uh, it should be stated that full repletion isn't required. And I do think that this is a strong case for moderate carbohydrate diets. And Louise Burke talked about this in one of her papers where high carbohydrate diet is typically that eight to 10 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And that's necessary for, for a fair amount of athletes. If you're training multiple hours, many times a week, that's probably about where you should reside. But for most of us, moderate carbohydrate intake is probably sufficient. That's on the lower end of that roughly half of it, four to five grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. 
per day. And that's still quite a lot of carbohydrate if you do the math. The uh, On top of this, daily fluctuations in muscle, muscle glycogen stores are kind of a, a necessary thing. So we're thinking, well, I want this to happen anyway. I want to be deplete, replete, deplete, repeat, because that's what promotes cell signaling and, and stimulates important training adaptations. So all of this is, is desirable. A word of caution, though, is as those, and we talked about this earlier, those under-fueled training days stack up the performance and therefore the stimulus and therefore the adaptation can decline. You can't stack these on end with no real repercussions. It's but all of this, too. it, it Sorry, is, so yeah. It's sneaky, like it, like you think you're fine and then you get two to three weeks into it and then suddenly you're not, right? Yeah, I heard it referred to as a 10 day crunch or a 10 day <laughs> effect the other day. Mm -hmm. And it, it does mm -hmm. seem to be right about 10 days too. I mean, you can push yourself hard for a week, maybe trickle a bit into the next week, but right around 10 days, we'll start to come off the wagon. But anyway, everything I just mentioned, all of it points to that we can probably get away with lifting without pre-workout, in-workout nutrition. So when it comes to resistance training, strength training, eh, maybe we don't need carbohydrate. And then I, I've just been paying attention and really anyone who's interested in strength training should have a subscription to, to mass, which is what monthly application of strength science. Uh, I believe anyway, so. Yes. Yeah, the guys at stronger by stronger by science and, and that, publication is, is worth its weight in gold, quite honestly. But they had an article titled Modest Glycogen Depletion May Impact Lifting Performance More Than You Think. Pretty pretty straightforward. And before I get to their key points, I do feel there's a bit of uh, science or uh, biology that we need to cover because though this stuff isn't emergent, we've known about this, scientists have known about this, studied this for at least 10 years that I know of, glycogen has multiple storage depots. So it's not just the muscle is packed with glycogen, but rather there are three different distinct depots in your muscle and each has different impacts on muscle fatigue and muscle function. So I'll, I'll keep this short, but the intro, so, so, so within a muscle, a muscle fiber, you have smaller fibers and these are called myofibrils. Intermyofibrillar stores, and these are between those myofibrils, holds most of the glycogen in the muscle, but roughly 75%, okay? And these are adjacent to particular organelles within the muscle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum where calcium release takes place and the mitochondria. Don't need to explain that to anybody. Another depot is subsarcolemmal. So that's just below basically the skin of the cell. So the little plasma membrane or lipid membrane, basically the wrapper of the cell holds a fair, a bit of, of glycogen as well on the order of five to 15%. And then very importantly, the intramyofibrillar stores. Now, these are within the myofibrils themselves, and they're right against the contractile filaments. So right against the actin and myosin. Again, 15 to 15%. What's interesting here is, is that these are the ones that are pre preferentially oxidized in both our type 1 and type 2 fibers. And again, this ties to the calcium release, et cetera. But when, this, when depletion occurs in this particular depot, this is being looked at determined or uh, described as the major a major driver of fatigue it has the greatest impact on muscle function this tiny little store and there's quite a bit of research to back this up so what's important here is it's it's this pool of glycogen storage in particular that seems to be more tightly linked to decreases in performance during high intensity intermittent exercise which you know our form of it is high intensity interval training so just this little tiny store that gets run down can be run down rather quickly and we'll get to that can have a pretty big impact on the productivity of your workout and obviously how you perform come race day. So the point is, even though that we can be completely loaded up coming into a workout, at least in terms of whole muscle glycogen, we can deplete the, the more limiting and limited stores, these intramuscular, uh, let me make sure I'm getting that right. The intramyofibrillar fiber, uh, glycogen depot, and we can do it really quickly. And you ask how quickly, um, study back from 1999, a single 30 second all out effort led to a 20 to 30% reduction in whole muscle glycogen. I mean, that's a huge hit cool. for just a 30 second, but all out workout. And this is the very nature of sprint intensity training where the ad adaptive stimulus is really derived from the rate of depletion. We're trying to suck as much glycogen out of the muscle, use it up as quickly as possible. This is what sends the adaptive stimulus. And then flash forward 2021, very recent paper, I think this is Ortenblatt again, they saw about an 8% performance impairment following just five, six second repeated sprints. So same 30 seconds, but now we're only doing them in little, little six second pops. And it still led to an 8% decrement in performance from the first sprint to the last sprint. So the, the point is, is that glycogen depletion can impact workout performance. This, this is known, but also lower levels of depletion can carry bigger performance impacts. 
And this leads to lower training stimulus, lower, you know, uh, subsequent training adaptation, mild increase, not a big deal. But once we get below a point, and as much as I'd like to quantify this for everybody, between papers, I was dealing with uh, wet weight and dry muscle weight and uh, millimoles per liter of and grams per kilogram of. I couldn't, I can't put a figure on this, but the point is, is that some lower level of whole muscle glycogen levels not nearly as low as we might think lead to significant decreases in performance. Hmm. I so, have some questions uh, sure. on this really quick. Uh, kind of like some, uh, this is like dumb guy logic questions. Uh, so bear with me, Chad, on this. But hmm. this seems like, so the thought process is, well, my strength training isn't really high intensity. Therefore, I don't need to fuel it with glycogen. Mm -hmm. That's like the logic. Yep, um, that's where we're going. But what you're showing here with this is the fact that like, well, even like your strength workouts could deplete glycogen more than we think. And mm -hmm. like you talked about the different storage sites, how that could then deplete the more perhaps heavily weighted glycogen in terms of its importance to be able to carry out certain functions. Exactly. And where that could really get complex is if you're doing strength training and then you're not fueling a whole lot and then you have your bike workout, right? That could, yep. that, that seems like where this could really bite somebody. That's exactly right. And that's, <clears throat> that's one of the things that's basically where I'm going because I haven't gotten back to strength training. And then when we talk about how we couple those two together. So, yeah. so, but, but everything I just discussed, I want to make it clear that it, it is my opinion, at least from my viewpoint, I think this can lead us down a path of downplaying the importance of just what you described, uh, either post strength training or even post endurance training carbohydrate intake. I mean, we tell ourselves workout was short, how much damage could I possibly have done? The better question to ask is specifically, where did this depletion take place? And we can't suss that out. I mean, we can't go in there and look, but we can read the research that I'm reading to you or talking about right now. So, <laughs> Nate, back away with your biopsy, biopsy needles. Biopsy, biopsy. <laughs> Need like a hundred biopsies to figure this out. Okay. So let's get back to the, the Stronger by Science, or specifically, it was an article written by Eric Trexler. Again, uh, resistance training only depletes muscle glycogen stores 24, 40%, right? So, so what's the concern? Well, whole muscle glycogen might only decrease modestly, but with strength training in particular, Type ones mostly saw, they saw decreases in that intermyofibrillar. So that's the big, you know, 75% storage depot. The type two fibers, however, were depleted in all three storage depots to, to varying extents. And they saw substantial, a substantial portion of the type twos were nearly fully depleted. So completely wiped them out. And, and this was high volume training. And for anyone who's going to ask, and it was with advanced athletes, but we can still extrapolate, I think pretty well. It was back squats, deadlifts and split dumbbell squats with leg elevated, so Bulgarian. So, so basically they're just hammering the low body. They would either do four or five sets, somewhere between four and 12 reps, depending on the exercise, 60 to 75% one RM. So not particularly heavy, but they would ramp it up to an eight or nine RPE. So they were pushing them to a point of near exhaustion per set, give them anywhere from one to six minutes recovery, depending on what exercise they did. Workout lasted about 70, 90 minutes. So not necessarily something we're going to be doing as endurance athletes, but mm, plenty of endurance athletes will do workouts like I just described. So back to the takeaways from, from, from this particular paper and credit to Str Stronger by Science. First off, uh, strength training without carbohydrate could actually impact any, well, actually this is my takeaway, any above endurance workout. So if you've done strength training and then you hop on the bike, your endurance fibers as well could have a bit of a glycogen hit. Fueling will be important. And then endurance workouts, or I'm sorry, that was above endurance. Obviously, those are the type twos. Mm -hmm. Those are the fibers that really got hit hard. When we go back to the type ones, that's that's when we have to concern ourselves with the, the interplay of the strength training and the endurance training workouts. If we're going to time them back to back, if we're going to separate them by so much time, fueling before and after is of big importance. And for reasons that probably we didn't credit before, all types of muscle fibers are getting hit, all the muscle fiber depots, or uh, sorry, the glycogen depots are getting hit to varying degrees. And I think all of this can be summed up really nicely by something that, that Eric Trexler put forward. He said that glycogen can't be viewed as a fuel tank because whole muscle glycogen stores and, and they're in repletion might not tell the entire muscle fatigue story. Because again, different depots deplete at different rates. This is called non-uniform depletion. Uh, the depletion of different depots has different effects on fatigue and performance. So we can't just say, I have this much muscle glycogen on board, all's well. Well, where is it on board? Because where it's located, how it's used, type of exercise you're doing can all have different impacts. And this Wild. also leads me to, 
to believe that there have got to be important parallels between endurance training and strength training and, and, and the interplay with glycogen. So I do think that we've got some potentially fun learnings from the strength training world that, that, that lay in wait for us. And then finally, got to make a quick honorable mention to the fact that when you have low carbohydrate stores, whether it's endurance training or strength training, it affects your motivation. You come into a, a workout with low motivation, that's one thing, but it can also affect your RPE. So everything you do in that workout with your less than loaded up uh, muscle state can impact how, how difficult or trying or taxing or uncomfortable the exercises are. Nate, your thoughts? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> just have to cover it here. <laughs> yeah i mean this is great good job chad thanks this is the, no. this is so recapping <clears throat> is it a good idea to do or should i be worried about doing strength workouts fasted in the mornings yeah uh, if you want to maximize the productivity of them and you feel uh, I, just just the the rpe aspects of it say to me eat a banana have a gel do something just to, I mean, have a, have a carbohydrate mouth, mouthwash, mouth rinse, spit it out if you're super concerned with calories, but if you're strength training, you got to fuel it anyway. So what's the harm in fueling it prior? And I do understand some people are going to come in with an iffy stomach and maybe that will, it will sway things a bit. So I don't know, give it 10, 15 minutes into your workout and then eat that same little banana mouth, mouth rinse. Yeah. This is a situation of, uh, so when you're strength training, you may not burn as many calories as what you do on the bike, but you're burning something. But instead of thinking about trying to balance the equation with the strength training, look at setting yourself up for success to adapt and recover from your subsequent endurance workouts. Like for me, it's just, it's, it's, there's, it's a different perspective of I'm trying to shave like all the grams that I can, and I'm trying to balance the equation step by step, or are you expanding your vision and thinking about, you know, monthly adaptations, you know, or, or adaptations on the scale of, you know, training phases across a whole year. It's a very different, very different approach. And if you adopt that perspective, I think that you'd change the, change the focus of the questions for sure. I feel my strength work. I absolutely do. I kind of have this rule. Alex Wilds mentioned this on the podcast. Like when he, his is like, when I pedal, I, I am taking in carbs and I have kind of the same rule of when I'm working productively, when I'm doing something, I am taking in carbs. If it's strength training or if it's me on the bike or running or swimming, I'm taking in carbs because I don't want to get to a point where I'm behind. That's like the fear that I run from is getting to a spot where I'm behind on carbs and I can't recover and I'm then going to be empty for the next one. So great question though, David, because it challenges the logical mind and what we think of. So well done, Chad. Uh, trivia time. Here we go. <clears throat> <laughs> we may, we may dump trivia if we get more reactions like that from Nate. Uh, all right. First question. And Nate, I want you to type in Nate and Chad. I want you to type in the answers to me. In but if Slack. we type it in, oh, in Slack, and then you'll just hit enter and then we'll be able to find it out. Okay. So I typed in, in the channel, uh, there we are. So then you get pinged with that first question. You can play along with us here at home of the 390 episodes of the ask a cycling coach podcast. How many episodes has on how many episodes has coach Chad appeared? Closest guess wins. Done. Did I win? Go ahead and type them in. Oh, I already typed it in. I messaged you. Already typed it in. Oh, Ooh, see, yeah, yeah we okay. got to message you. If we message the yep. same channel, we can all yes. see our Good answers. call. Good call, Chad. We catch their name. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so thing, um... 390 episodes. On how many episodes have you appeared, Chad? Dun, 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 dun. Did you not? Chad, just guess. Did he guess? <laughs> oh, yeah. You want me to say it? This is really no. Belabored. Just say it, Chad. Oh, just say I'm it. Because I already typed now it. I can... I'm gonna guess. <laughs> I'm gonna guess three three hundred thirty three. Whoa! And I Nate said three thirty. Three hundred and thirty, and Nate wins because it's two hundred and eighty one. Is the amount ah, of episodes that Chad's been on. <clears throat> well done. A lot. All right, Nate gets a point. According to Endura's wind tunnel testing, in which riding position was famous athlete and engineer Graham O'Brien fastest? A with a modern TT bike following a UCI fit, B, the Superman position, or C, the tuck position? Is the tuck Nate's position the answer is submitted? shoulders on his hands on the bars? Correct. Correct. That's the one. Got to go, Chad. It's like speed chess. <laughs> oh, I say no it. thinking. Tuck position. I feel like I should know this. I've read both his yep. books. Okay. And Chad says tuck position. Nate says Superman position. Chad is correct. It's the tuck position. Counterintuitive. Although the Superman position earned the most of the fame, Graham O'Brien's tuck position was actually faster with a 0.172 CDA. That's insanely low. That's crazy. The Superman position had a 0.2 CDA. 
proving Graham O'Brien's slipperiness, he was able to achieve a CDA of 0.188 within UCI guidelines on a modern TT bike, which is also insanely fast. That's like uh, crazy fast. Which of the following teams used Campagnolo group sets in 2022? Kofidis, Movie Star, or Israel Premier Tech? Gonna say Kofi. We're, we're all tied up at this point. Chad hmm. says Kofi Dees. Nate says movie star. Chad wins. It was Kofi Dees. Only three teams used Campanola group sets, but that was surprisingly more than SRAM. Only two teams used SRAM, Movie Star and Trek Sigafredo. You skipped but I question bet that's going to change by the way. this year. Oh, sorry. Say that again. Oh, yeah, I did. Here we go. Question three Which French cyclist holds the Strava KOM on Alpe d'Huez? Roman Bardet, Julian Alaphilippe, or Thibaut Pinot? Nate says Pinot. I'm going to say Pinot. And Chad says Pinot, and you both missed it. It's Roman Bardet. Gosh, he held... We suck at this. <laughs> it's not bad. We're, we're, we're close now. 2-1. We're like basically the same rider, so we got it right. <laughs> Chad's going to get hate mail from our French listeners. So he held six, the next watts one. Per, six watts per kilo for 36 minutes up that climb. 381 watts. That's in the middle of the tour as well, which is pretty impressive because not often Whoa. do the fastest times come in the middle of the tour. All right, uh, number five. In the famous 1989 Ironman World Championships dubbed the Iron War, which athlete ended up winning and setting a new course record time? A, Mark Allen, B, Greg Welch, or C, Dave Scott? That'd be Mark Allen, right? Is that your answer, Chad? Yeah. Yeah, Mark Allen, you both got it right. <clears throat> both Mark Allen and Paula newby Frazier set course records that day, but interestingly, both those times are the exact same amount in terms of the difference between the current world record and now they're 6% slower, the women's and men's records from 1989 to now. Pretty crazy. That's crazy. Right? Mm -hmm. So like, cause mm -hmm. there's all these theories about, is it equipment getting faster? Is it athletes getting faster? But when you have both pro men and women, and it's like, it's like 6.04% is, is the difference between those records and these it's probably records equipment today. and, uh, science. Yeah, totally. A little bit Training. Both. Yeah. Training yep. science. Yeah. All right, uh, question six. We only have two left. Uh, at this point, Chad's up by one. <clears throat> Using VAM calculations, what power-to-weight ratio did Anamiek Van Vluten hold up La Planche de Belfi in the 2022 Tour de France Femmes? A, 4.8 watts per kilogram. B, 4.6 watts per kilogram. Or C, 4.9 watts per kilogram. Nate got his answer in. Chad? Let's see, 4.9. The answer is 4.8 watts per kilogram. You were quite close. Uh, Nate missed it too. That's just uh, unfair. It's so close. <laughs> so I should have spent him out. Or spent I don't know really the answer to this next one, which is crazy. I've it's, looked it up before. <laughs> it's assumed that she held 278 watts for the 31 minutes and 22 seconds. That's after multiple crashes, after being sick, and on the last day of their second to last day, I believe, of the tour, which is pretty wow. darn crazy. Um, super impressive. How many times has Nate started his favorite workout in the Trainer Road catalog? This is our last que question. And of course, the workout is Baxter. Is it A, 87 times, B, 93 times, or C, 102 times? It's a D. It's not my favorite workout, so it is. <laughs> just, I've just done a lot. <laughs> Nate submitted his answer. Chad, what's your, what's your guess? High end, 102. 102. Nate also said 102, and you both missed it. It's 93 times. So quite close though. Nate, what is your favorite workout? I don't know. Not Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> was, oh man. You, you like Brandon like Baxter of... forever. Chad won by one point. Uh, well done, Chad. Mm. Chad's the trivia winner. Um, I'm surprised Chad hasn't brought a beverage to trivia quite yet, but if you played along yeah. in our live chat, which it looks like people absolutely did play along the live chat. Good to have you with us. If you enjoy trivia, let us know. If you don't enjoy it, also let us know so then we can cut it and not do it again, or we can do more of it, whatever you like. Uh, we're going to have a survey coming out soon for all of you podcast listeners, and we'll have a link to it. It'll be at trainerroadcom slash podcast, where we collect every year, we collect feedback from you on what you like and what you don't like and what you want more of. So if you want to participate in that, we would love that. And that will be at trainerroadcom slash podcast. So stay tuned for that soon. Lumpy says, what do you do during a long gap between very different events? I recently completed a 250 kilometer gravel race, the furthest I've ever ridden. That's a big day. Uh, after 20 weeks of focusing on building my endurance for a long event, I am aerobically fitter than I've ever been right now, but my next event is not for another five months and is a much shorter race than my last one, only around two hours. 
with such a large gap between events, what can I do to take the mo- to take or make the most of my time over the next few months? Eat carbs. I- <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just, just, carb load. Load. just that's it. Yeah. Start start loading. That's uh, a joke, everyone. As- I feel as though I've built a strong or strong base fitness, which I desperately don't want to lose. That's a really key point to this one. Perhaps even more important than like, what do I do is I'm afraid of losing all of this aerobic fitness that I've built up. I'm 28, six foot at 67 kilograms. So that's right around 148 pounds, 150 pounds ish. Uh, and enjoy climbing fast, uh, obviously with that sort of, you know, power to weight ratio you got going on there. Uh, could I focus on so- or focus solely on losing a bit of weight, working on my FTP or building muscle, or should I just use this time to rest? Thanks in advance from Lumpy. Nate, do you want to start off on your uh, thoughts on this one, and then we can go to Chad? Yeah. So if they, uh, if Lumpy has a, a really big aerobic base, it took a really long time to build that up, but it's also going to take a really long time for it to go away. And I wouldn't be so concerned right now about it. It. Um, losing a little bit of fitness or trying to maintain that same volume doing we've seen time and time again with studies that doing a little bit will hold up a lot of that fitness and the biggest mistake would be to do too much before these five months or early in these five months so that when you get to a month or two out that's when you're burnt and you're crispy and you don't want to do anything else after that also a two-hour event that is very similar it's going to be aerobic too so that your 155 mile 250 kilometer uh gravel race It's going to be kind of the same thing. Um, The only difference might be is, and you don't say it, so I'm guessing it's not like a road race that could be super punchy. The two hours aerobically, I mean, the person who's going to win the two-hour aerobic race of a gravel event is the same person who's going to win the 250 of it. As long as if fueling is equal and they don't mess that up, uh, like like Keegan's a good example, really good long stuff, but he's still probably going to win a two-hour one unless there's some punchy and you know crazy stuff like that. Uh, So I would, I mean, take what two weeks off maybe. And then start in a lower volume plan if you're using trainer road and how to use plan builder. And that's just a broken record. And then maybe <laughs> up it to mid volume when you're about two months out to see if you, if you're feeling like it, but don't go up the volume too much. I don't know how much volume you're doing before, but basically I would do a little bit of volume, a little less volume or a lot less volume than you were doing going into this big race. Make sure first you recover from this big race and then slowly wrap up the volume. And, uh, I, I bet you money, you're going to be stronger after those five months, if you do it that way, then trying to say, getting upset if you lose, you know, five, 10 watts in your FTP now, and then trying to panic train and then just be crispy and horrible later on. Chad. Yeah, that's all good advice. I, I do think uh, maybe a period of time off the bike, just it's just a short period, like we talk about with when you end most seasons where you take 10 days to two weeks, even a that's week. That's what I said. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's why I said all, all sound advice. I'm going to echo pretty much maybe everything you said. <laughs> yeah, a little time off. And then and maybe for a period of two, three weeks past that, ride in ways that are fun for you. I mean, don't don't look at it as training right away. So do make sure you are thoroughly refreshed. Again, Nate already touched on this. So that you're eager to train again. Um, you got five months. That's quite a long period. Definitely don't front load it again, like Nate said, because that's 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 a recipe for burnout right there. You're, gonna, you're coming off something that was very demanding, jumping back into something that's very structured and demanding going to, going to burn yourself up, burn yourself out. I'm guessing you did a heck of a lot of long rides. If you want to keep that topped off, I would just match one of those. So whatever your long ride was for the week, if you can incorporate that into what you do for the next, uh, you know, past this month of off time or cross training or however you decide to mix it up, weave that long ride back in and then just keep some intensity. And, and you can go so many different directions on that intensity, whether it's a, a sprint intensity workout, a VO two max work, I would do something punchy that touches a lot of muscle fibers. So something that does require a lot of, a lot of contribution just to keep those systems apprised of the fact that you are still relying on them and you don't want them to dissipate. The language that Lumpy's using after 20 weeks of focusing on building my endurance for a long event and uh, the the furthest distance I've ever done, this is probably a big undertaking for you, Lumpy, to, to do that sort of thing. And there's, and what I'm not going to talk about the mechanics because I think that what you two recommended was fantastic. I'm going to talk about the psychology of it. I think that we often don't understand the sort of psychological toll that doing that sort of training takes on us and having a break from that can be so, so helpful, just psychologically speaking, because I think we're fine. And we even tell ourselves, I don't know, Lumpy, maybe you just did like low intensity work while you were uh, building up for this. So you're thinking like, oh yeah, I'm ready to go and I can keep going. 
but you're like, uh, if you could graph totally separately, your mentality and your ability to focus and maintain motivation, it's like a, almost like a separate body that you're training. Right. And you can't just continually push that envelope and expect it to get better. Uh, just like basic principles of periodization apply to physical improvement with the body, but they also, at least in my experience and the experience of athletes that I talk to, they also apply to the psychological improvement of the body too. So if you don't give it some rest, then it can be really tough. Uh, I, we've talked plenty of times about this, about how, uh, about what is it, uh, Chad, is it the nuclei, the persistent nuclei that end up staying with you as you build up over time and you build up all of these aerobic, uh, this aerobic adaptation that comes with a greater mitochondrial density. And as you become less fit, it's not as if those things just completely disappears and vaporizes, but rather you can get back to that point quicker than somebody that's starting from scratch. So again, remember the fact that you're not, your body's not going to entirely forget how to be aerobically fit uh, from this. If you take some time off, or if you reduce your training load, psychologically speaking, don't burden yourself with that concern. That's a, that's a message for all of us that we can, you know, we can be okay with. So I'm also curious to know what Lumpy's history was prior to this event. Cause if this was something that he came off the couch, worked at for quite some time, did this 250 K, which is 150 miles. It's quite a long event. And, and that's most that defines most of his, or their cycling background, cycling history, probably a different recommendation. You're probably going to have a lower or a longer recovery trajectory. Um, it, this could take a, just a greater toll on you. So do be vigilant in the, the weeks and even maybe months following an event like this, if you didn't have a big history, big training history coming into it. Yeah. Uh, this is, have you, uh, have either of you experienced this where you do some big event and maybe you get like a good result or one that you're satisfied with and you almost feel like you've reached a pinnacle and it's tough to like kind of muster up motivation for the next thing. Have any, has anybody felt that? No, it's the opposite for me. If I do well I an event, I just want to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I have in the sense that to compete at a high level, I recognize how much work that was and, and the idea of d diving back into that much work and perhaps increasing the amount of work to, to be even better was a, a little intimidating, a lot intimidating. Yeah. We get questions about that where athletes feel like I've achieved my, like my magnum opus is <laughs> like, done, you know what I mean? Like, like I did it. What do I do now? And it's like, uh, it's daunting to think of going back to, to something again. And, um, I'd encourage anybody if in, and even if Lumpy's in this situation too, of thinking about like, what do I do now? I don't want to lose anything, but I'm not sure I'm, you know, really want to commit into the next thing. I know that you have that two hour gravel race, but, um, if you're in that situation, listen to the podcast that we just recorded two episodes ago. So it'd be 398 <clears throat> or 388, 388, forgive me with Hannah, fin, uh, Hannah Otto. And she talked about how she managed that because she wins Leadville. And then suddenly she's like, all right, now what do I do for the next races that I have? Like, do I have to win every single one? She had really great insight to share on that one. So go listen to episode 388. Last question from Dom. <clears throat> and then if we have some time, we might take some live questions. So if you're pay if you're watching right now, like this video. And again, go down and uh, share your questions in the live chat and we'll see what we can do. Dom says, love the content of the podcast and trainer wrote. Since my last question, I've managed to reach my goal for the summer to raise my FTP above 300. Well done, Dom. It's a big number. Uh, now on to my next goal of four watts per kilogram. I was surprised to see how my FTP decreased after I had reached my goal. Once I focused more on structure, unstructured outdoor rides. Hey, you and everybody else there too, Dom. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. And we focus on less structure. We don't get as fast. Uh, not always looking forward to the pain of structured sweet spot rides again, but it works. So I'm back at it again, <clears throat> not just sweet spot, but everything, right? So Dom says, here's my actual question. There's been a lot of talk on the podcast about nutrition. And I have myself experienced the large effect nutrition has on my performance. My challenge is that I can do long days fueled on gels, but once I'm home, I feel very nauseous. I've been trying to mix in more solids, but that did not help much either, which I wouldn't expect it to. Uh, although that is common advice that's given. It's like, yeah, you can't just eat gels. That's why your gut's upset. Um, you should eat solids. And I don't think that's good advice. Another issue is that now I am back to more indoor training and I'm looking for an alternative way to feel the workouts going with gels and all the other commercial options like Marten and scratch is really getting expensive. I simply cannot afford to take in three to four gels per training session. And I'm sure there are some simple and cost-effective options for us athletes that are not sponsored. 
I always enjoy when you talk about some of your nutrition tips and would like to hear more about ideas about fueling rides with alternatives to expensive gels and drink mixes. Thank you so much for all your awesome work that you're doing. Dom. I agree with this, right? Nate, like it can get pretty crazy. Like yeah. uh, pe we've talked about this and if you go onto our Instagram and even to our blog, we've broken down like the cost of getting faster and measured different things. This is why like, I'm really proud of like where, you know, trainer roads an affordable option for people to get faster. If you have like four Marten gels during your workout, you've spent more than your trainer road subscription <laughs> for like for a month. the month, yeah. <laughs> for right. the whole month. Yeah, for one workout. <laughs> yeah. For one workout. So this is, this is a really good point. Uh, Nate, what would you have to say in this case? Uh, we have two separate issues. There's one that just taking in gels makes me not feel good after the ride. And then number two, how do I do this cost effectively? Yeah, this is like, um, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but we, I agree. And if you look at the ingredients for these things, it's cheap. And we actually at Trina Road had like seven different drink mixes. Like we wanted to make our own drink mix, but then just focus more on adaptive training. It's just more distraction stuff. So John, we were like using it and we had uh, all these ideas for like um, a variable sodium intake for it to have it kind of like as a side thing. And it's all we, just sugar and salt. <laughs> that's, that was going to be the, the name of the brand, sugar and salt. <laughs> so yeah. like, it's not that complicated. And uh, what, what we did is we just bought um, maltodextrin and fructose. And we tried a whole bunch of other types of sugars and stuff. And that was the best. Uh, you can buy them in bulk on Amazon for, I don't know, it's like, it's so cheap. It is, it is yeah. ridiculously cheap. It's cheaper than if, food. If people, I mean, it is can food, I, but yeah. To interrupt really quickly on this. Uh, if you go to my Instagram, Lee Jonathan, you can see where I share like how I do the very thing that Nate's talking about. For me, I found that glucose worked better than maltodextrin, and I have and I'll have I have specific links too to the glucose and fructose. I swear I get like three questions a day on the links to the specific things I get. I buy it in bulk, and it ends up being roughly I think it's like sixteen or thirty two cents a bottle, something like that. Um, so it's it's quite cheap when you bring it in and it's just sugar and salt, and then you're not bringing in anything else. Um, super cheap and affordable because there's no way that I could afford 120 grams an hour of doing all those workouts. Yeah. So that's a good point, John, is that, uh, what, uh, Dom wants to do is you're going to, it's, there's like three variables. There's the amount that you're taking, I guess the amount to the duration of, um, how often you take it during the ride. There is the ratio between glucose, glucose and fructose. And then there is the type of like way you're getting your glucose, which is maltodextrin table sugar uh, glucose. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can, you can put it into your bottle. And I would, what I would do is I would go on Amazon if in the U S and buy little bits of each of those and try different ratios in it, uh, and see which one you feel good at. And then also start low on all of those, because if you start too high on all of them, it could be a winning combo, but it could be too high for you and just start experimenting with that. And I bet you could, I mean, I bet you could figure this out for $10, right? And it's, mm -hmm. And then you could get something that is sustainable that you could use. The one problem that I've seen, John, I don't know if you've gone over this is, or fix this is that, uh, they're usually not very mixable. Oh, like mine's compared perfect. To, it takes oh. like five seconds of shaking my bottle and it's perfect. It's done. So, oh. and that was, that was the big thing is finding the right, like, like it would say glucose, but I buy that glucose from five different companies in small little bags. And then I would test it to see which one mixed better, which one tasted better, which one didn't have weird aftertaste. A lot of them have like weird flavors to them instead of just sugar. And that can be kind of off-putting. And yeah, glucose and fructose, just really simple. Yeah. The idea is we could have done like, you could sell it by itself, but which is its own huge market, but you could do a subscription where we know your workouts and we could just tell you exactly how much to put in each specific bottle for every workout that you're doing. Yes. And depending on your load and your volume and stuff, we could weigh it right and uh because we know your whole training history right so when chad says you're doing eight to ten um uh, grams per carb rate per hour if you're doing a lot of training you do less and we could kind of give you targets of carbs in the other time of the day uh but there's just too many ideas and not enough time <laughs> that's the truth i'm going to share the link in the live chat so if you're listening to this go to youtube and then you can find in the live chat you should subscribe to our youtube channel and then you can find the link to the things that i use there so I'll oh, share and we were going to go, I'm just to say the whole thing, we're going to go direct to consumer and we're going to make it super cheap because we're a software company. So we don't need to make a lot of money from selling sugar and salt and sugar and salt is cheap. So that the idea was to, it would make cyclists faster because we think it's important to be able to fuel your workouts. And we know that's a barrier for a lot of people to, to really get faster on train road in general is the, how expensive it is. But now everyone can just do it yourself. 
and uh Mm-hmm. Even I was going to even give the recipes out for free and just be like, hey, this is convenience. If you don't want to do it, you can buy it from us. And we might even be able to do it cheaper because we could buy it in bulk. And that is the the big uh, issue. What I have to do is I have to bulk process it. So basically, like when I get it, I have to set aside a good chunk of time where then I measure out and I put in my one to eight ratio of glucose to fructose and I put it in a Ziploc bag and I do another one and I do another yeah. one. The Let us know. Downside... The... Go ahead. Go ahead. The other downside let... to this. <laughs> Sorry, Nate. The other downside to this is that you do not want to travel with your homemade premix. Like if you're flying yeah. international borders here or crossing them, you have a bunch of bags of like unlabeled white powder. Like you're probably going to get stopped for stuff. So that's like when I went to Cape Epic, I used Marten because I did not want to get stopped and have to go through any hassle. Uh, the important part with this though is that I can bounce back and forth between Marten and this, and I find zero difference whatsoever in terms of fueling ability. But the cost is way more achievable. So yeah, Nate, sorry, go ahead now. <laughs> yeah. If you, we can still do this. So if people are interested, leave a comment and in the chat. So if it, there's a big, like this is needed in the industry, we can try doing it. But, uh, if not, I would, I would hate to put all this effort into it and then nobody wants it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Good point. Now let's talk about the gels thing. Uh, when he just taking gels and then his stomach gets upset thereafter, uh, mm-hmm. Chad, I kind of have two ideas, but uh, what are yours? Yeah, well, first off, I was going to land at the same place you guys landed with homemade drinks. In, in terms of keeping the cost down, the materials are super cheap. The, it, there is a slight opportunity cost in that now you have to mix it yourself. So do weigh that in into the equation. But I was going to suggest just trying something more dilute. You mentioned having, you know, used gels primarily, but then supplemented with solids. Things, things still aren't going well. So if you just can consider the osmolality or the dilution, the concentration, let's just call it that. Of, of, of like a typical gel, and I'll just use Science and Sport as an example, they're 22 grams of carbohydrate per 60 milliliter container. And that brings you pretty close to 40% concentration. I mean, it's like 37%. So that's some pretty concentrated stuff. And I think that's a large part of the problem. It has been with me. And I do think that maybe the learning curve is a bit steeper in terms of how your gut responds to excess uh, sugar in such a high concentration. Could be, when you look at most carbohydrate beverages, at least the the ones of you know maybe 10 years ago with the lower concentrations or even still the concentrations way way lower we're talking four to six percent concentration so maybe 20 or 30 grams of carbohydrate in a 500 milliliter bottle that that's pretty standard fare and now we're seeing ones that are higher carbohydrate but they don't bump it up too much and and i'll I'll lean on science and sport again and use their beta fuel which is 40 grams of carbohydrate in a 500 milliliter bottle that just brings it up to eight percent so, I mean, you can get quite a lot of carbohydrate over the course of a single bottle at a much lower concentration, and that might job just a bit better with, with your gut. Yeah. I'm, one of the thoughts that I have is dehydration. Uh, in, if you are taking in a lot of, first of all, I, I guess the main thing is if you can't take in 80 grams an hour or whatever you're doing, and then you're taking that in and you haven't worked your way up to that and then maintained that, then yeah, you're going to get d- gut distress. Like you have to train your gut and it has to be in that habit of being able to handle that. So work your way into it. But the other part that's really common is dehydration. If you're dehydrated and you're taking in high amounts of carbohydrate like that, yeah, it's going to mess up your gut. Um, and with gels, it can be a bit trickier, like Chad said, uh, for that reason. I also, I tried to make my own gels to like see if, how that would work. And that was a mess. It was really tough. Um, I kind of got something remotely close to it and then putting it in a vessel is a pain. It's really costly. Uh, it's way cheaper to do your mix if you can, if you can just make everything you drink comes through your mix. Um, eventually you will get over the palate fatigue thing, especially with such like a neutral flavor. And then you'll just be like, yeah, okay, is what it is. Um, and you get used to it. So, but it's, it's more cheap, cost-effective. And also it's a little bit easier to stay on top of your hydration when you make sure that you're drinking a lot of fluid that's coming with your carbohydrate at all times, it can be really helpful. So my, my main thing when I see that is probably some level of dehydration is creeping in that's causing that sort of gut distress, or it could just be taken in too much. Yeah. That's the one thing that, that the nutrition companies do well, or well, maybe not do well, but one thing you get is uh, flavors flavor. We thought of, we had a bunch of them, but the one I was most excited about was cucumber mint. Doesn't that Ooh. sound good? Refreshing, like, what was, right? Yeah. Why don't we have cucumber? Uh, yeah, that's what you want refreshing and not super sweet. And th- there were some other ones too, that I forget. It was a green tea one. I think other companies do green tea. I think uh, um, Scratch does it too. But uh, yeah, do you remember them, John? No. Yeah, there was like an elderberry something else that was like mm-hmm. a really that was like a really good one, like a floral note one. 
Um, you don't have to have things be like, you know, red, yellow, pink, green and like <laughs> already yellow, orange. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. And like really heavy flavors. Like it can be light ones. We had like, uh, some really like cool, like tropical light herbal, uh, sort of flavors rather than like, you know, mango or something that's like really strong and, and, and kind of messes yeah, up. That's, the what gut, you, so. that's what you want is just a teeny bit of flavor, like yeah, the teeniest sure. bit where too, you wouldn't. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Cucumber mint. Someone's asking questions. I don't know if they're happy about it or they're upset about it in the chat, but let us know in the comments too. Cause if you comment on this episode, more mm -hmm. people will see it. Yeah. And there's a lot of interest in the live chat. So, um, there's a few questions in there. Let's cover a few of them uh, with just a few minutes that we have left here. Um, okay. Uh, first one that we have, uh, actually along these lines, if you use table <clears throat> sugar, do you need to heat the water to get a proper dissolution of the sugar in the water? And tons of people have asked that question of like, shouldn't I just use sucrose or table sugar? Because it's like that, it's like a one-to-one -one ratio. And they're like, so it's fine. I can take that in. And while that is true in a lot of cases, table sugar isn't very refined as uh, this is from talking to Dr. Podlegar about this. <clears throat> so you're kind of getting, it's a bit of like a Russian roulette sort of thing in terms of how refined it is, how high quality it is, everything else. And it also does not dissolve well at all. And that's a, if, uh, Nate's mentioned this before having your bottles mixed and ready before your workouts, that's like, uh, it's a small thing, but if you have to shake your bottle and it never dissolves, and you have to go through this whole process, that's going to make doing your workouts harder. And that's a really bad idea. Like any barriers that you introduce to make your workout harder, sometimes it takes the smallest little thing to make you go, forget it, I'm not going to do my workout. And that's one of the reasons that I don't use table sugar, uh, because it just doesn't dissolve well. So I don't keep sugar on my table, but like regular white sugar. Sorry, that's a bad joke. Dad joke. Um, and never, nothing, I've never had worse gas than when I made a bottle with that. I did it yeah. once and I was like, okay, I'm done. Uh, yeah, yeah, it can mess things up. For Sergio sure. says we should have like a gravel flavor and TT flavor. We should have one that just tastes like like iron. Like, like <laughs> you know how you get that when you go really hard? It just tastes yeah, like that all sure. the time. So when you, you go that way, you don't even know. Just like this is this is the new normal. You're prepared for it. Maybe Everything's it creates fine. a Pavlovian response. And, and like gravel tastes like dirt. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. a little crunchy. Nice. Yeah, we put a little sand in it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, a uh, question from Ray. I assume most people start structured training for the first time, uh, who start structured training for the first time, already have some sort of cycling experience. Any tips for somebody starting a trainer road plan one week after getting into cycling? Welcome, Ray, to cycling. That's awesome. And I'm glad you found us so soon. That's super cool. Assuming, Ray, that you are the one, perhaps you're asking for a friend, but uh, yeah, uh, somebody that's getting into things just one week, uh, or getting into structured training just one week into cycling. Nate, what are your thoughts? I don't, what is the question? I'm trying to read it. They're getting into so, one week. Some, and then what's the question? Somebody that's just fresh into cycling one week old into cycling effectively. And yeah. what should I do to, should I just get started with structured training right now? Or are there things I should do beforehand? Uh, yeah. Get an S works bike, everything carbon. <laughs> 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 just kidding. Um, I it's ugh, man. Uh, so do what you think is fun. If you think structured training is your type of person that thinks that you like hard work consistency, uh, and that pays off to being faster, do that. Uh, there's a lot of people coming in who you come from CrossFit. You love that structure. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. Uh, you're not going to race as fast if you just go, go that, but it, right now it's developing the love of cycling. And for me personally, I love doing intervals from the very beginning. I felt, I loved seeing that next time when I would do the interval, it would be a little bit easier at the same power, or I could go a little bit faster. Um, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that that's pretty much it. And be consistent and don't overdo it and watch out for injuries because when you first start, it's easy to have an engine that's bigger than your body, especially come for another sport and you get that knee pain, right? And you're like, you ignore it. And then that turns into a multi-year uh, fiasco for some people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that, those, that's my advice, but just enjoy it. This is the best time you're going to, you're going to go up so much, so fast, your fitness, especially oh, if yeah. you do structured training, it's the best. Um, I like to take a couple years off every now and then and then come back. So I just have that same experience. <laughs> <laughs> There's the motivation behind it all. Uh, good advice. Uh, Chad, I don't know if you have any advice or do you want me to move on to the next one? All right, I'll move on to the next one. Um, no, I'm back. I'm back. Just okay. in time. What was the question? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Chad's internet's messing up. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, next question is cycling, then upper body weight lifting after, is that okay to do? And I've seen this question asked multiple times here today from MJ. So yeah, MJ. Yeah. It's totally, totally fine. No, no issue whatsoever. It's still a poll on resources. So do, do account for the fact that it's still uh, another form of training stress that you're piling onto something that might be 
a, a, a tightrope. But if it's not, if you have those additional resources, then uh, you're not going to get a whole lot of conflict in terms of the interference effect, et cetera. Yeah, and that's uh, the other part with this too is if you're doing any sort of movements that would require uh, upper body, like if you're just doing like overhead presses or something like that, uh, and if you're really exhausted from your bike workout, keep that in mind to be safe when you're doing strength training. Um, you don't want to come into a strength training workout just like so shattered that you can hardly stand and then you're like, yeah, overhead presses, here we come, you know, and throw your back out. So keep that present too. Uh, we've mentioned that one. Uh, okay. And then the last question that we'll cover from Dylan, this one's tricky. I have a question when trying to self find my zone two, <laughs> I just like that, that part right there, because there's a whole lot packed into self find my zone two. Um, the conversation model or nose breathe model gets me to a higher HR than it should be. I'm questioning the should be part, uh, Dylan on, on what you're saying should be in terms of HR. And then is there some, is there some sort of cardiac drift way or drift at pause or at play? I assume that's what you're saying there. Um, at the end of that look like that's, this is the, yeah, Nate, go ahead. It's a moving those are target, such, huh? Those are so, so two such huge variable things. Breathing through your nose. We talked about like the anatomy of your nose and allergy and stuff like that. And then talking like this rate of which you talk, the amount of words that you talk like that all comes into uh, play also. And I, those might be big, huge rules of, rules of thumbs, but you at least have a heart rate monitor. You could use that, but hopefully you have power. That's even better to find that zone too. And I wouldn't use maybe tools that we said in the eighties um, that somebody, whoever told you that I bet is from the eighties or uh, <laughs> it's heard someone from the eighties, but there's better ways to do it now. And I, I wouldn't focus on those two rules of thumb. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, there's kind of, man, this is a, this is a rat's nest that we aren't going to get into right now uh, because boy, it could explode in terms of like self-finding Z2. <laughs> Nate backs I like away. to meditate on it. It yeah. just, it comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, heck it might be as accurate as anything else. Um, but the, the, it's really complicated. Uh, it's made really complicated and it's made really simple by a lot of different perspectives. Um, but the key is a lot of athletes, I think, once again, a common thing that I see the best athletes I know don't concern themselves so much with those sort of details. And they concern themselves more with the consistency and the productivity of their training. Like, are they doing the work rather than are they fretting about the work? So, uh, there's a lot of debate on whether you're working at one or 2% above or below your, your actual zone two with zone two training and how that, and by one person's perspective entirely invalidates all of your training and all of your effort. And then by another person's perspective keeps you spot on. So it's a, it's a nebulous space. That's, that's really like uh, complicated to define. So, uh, all right. Thanks everybody for joining us. Nate, thanks for coming on the podcast. Should we release the pre recording? <laughs> 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 we can show you all while we're a few minutes late. Uh, we might do that on our Instagram or TikTok. Stay tuned. Uh, head over to Insta or head over to Instagram, Twitter, everything else, whatever you use, TikTok, follow trainer road, go and sign up for trainer road, build your best season yet. AI FTP detection means you never have to do a test again. That should alone should be enough to get you to sign up. No more FTP testing. It's pretty exciting. So go sign up for it and we'll talk to you all next week. Submit those questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody.